This weekend brought news of the passing of George H.W. Bush, and absent a complete look at the life of the former president, I'll just provide some information that I think it was one of his most important days in public service. And it wasn't as president. It was as vice president. March 30th, 1981, the day of the assassination attempt on President Reagan. The interesting thing about that day, when you really examine it, is that it was a day where both Bush or Reagan thought maybe something big could happen, but not what turned out to happen. Uh, this from the Dallas Morning News. The day of the shooting began in routine fashion. Bush donned a simple gray suit in his second floor bedroom at the vice president's residence. As he went downstairs for his daily national security briefing, an early morning rain fell outside the Victorian mansion off the grounds of the U.S. Naval Observatory. Two miles away in his second floor suite at the White House, Reagan chose a brand new blue pinstripe that had been made by his Beverly Hills tailor as a gift from Nancy Reagan. He went down the elevator to the first floor to the Blue Room and received the exact same security briefing that Bush was receiving. And topic A was Poland. A labor dispute there had turned the situation into a potential Soviet invasion. And in Poland, the military taking action and instituting martial law. Both Reagan and Bush's briefings were missing satellite images. They were told about movements of artillery and motorized units near Poland's border with East Germany, Czechoslovakia, and the USSR. Security advisor Dick Allen says, There was a strong possibility that day that the Soviets might invade, but there was cloud cover over Eastern Europe, and so we had no overheads. The Navy's ultra-secret underwater listening system, SOSIS, heard the usual two Soviet ballistic missile submarines churning the deep water off the east coast of the United States. Nothing but routine. And as a light drizzle blanketed Washington, Bush's green marine helicopter lifted him from above his home, past the symmetrical hedges in the gardens of the British Embassy next door, and towards Andrews Air Force Base. Within minutes, the helicopter lands on the tarmac next to the waiting Air Force Two, the plane which the vice president is traveling in. And at this time, at least, due to Jimmy Carter's insistence that some of the regality of the presidency be removed, it's not the plane that has that nice blue stripe and seal and just like that. The 707 was now plain white with a narrow yellow stripe. Under a cluster of umbrellas, Bush, his aide Untermeyer, Fitzgerald, the appointment secretary, all board the plane. They're going to Texas. Bush is from Texas, and, I mean, not originally, but this is the state that he's associated with at the time of his election as vice president, and it's a kind of a victory lap. It would begin with a morning stop in Fort Worth, and then in the afternoon, he would speak to the Texas legislature, just to kind of shore up the home crowd. I mean, there for Reagan and Bush, but just to keep the lines of communication open. There were two things that, at this time, Bush knew he would be asked about. Poland and Al Haig. Al Haig, the Secretary of State, was already having some conflicts with White House staff and other White House cabinet members and the national security team and reporters were asking questions about it so he wanted to be ready with his speech writer and at 10 45 a.m which would have been 11 45 a.m in the east the plane gently descended towards carswell air force base a concrete asterisk of runways shaded around the edges by a fresh growth of spring grass a waiting motorcade took the vice president downtown And at the Tarrant County Convention Center, near Fort Worth, Bush held a press conference before a lunchtime speech. Reporters, of course, asked him about Al Haig. 
I like that. Given the choice of Poland, the possible Soviet invasion, or Al Haig, they chose. White House intrigue. Bush response. Everything's been said about this, and I don't want to confuse it further by commenting. I have great respect for Haig, and nothing's happened to diminish this. Dallas Morning News article that I'm mostly repeating here is from 2015, but it, um, you know, it's wise to point out that we're talking about 1981. So Bush is 56. So the image most of you probably have of Bush, because even as president, he was a little bit older, right? Uh, slower moving and everything. This is a very kind of spry uh, guy that's running around, and he's a vice president who, from the beginning, wants to be seen as a potential presidential candidate. He had ran for president in 1980. Crazy thing to do because his previous experience had always been, I mean, he's a congressman, but other than that, it always been a, as an insider. And he was picked for the ticket because there was the talk that former President Ford might join Reagan on the ticket. And when that didn't happen, they were looking for a substitute who would be kind of on the more moderate side of the party and someone that Ford would uh, agree with. Bush was chosen. I talked about the Reagan assassination attempt on the first episode of a dozen Ronald Reagans and um, on this podcast, and I think I'll just repeat what I talked about there. 1981, President Ronald Reagan makes a speech at the Washington Hilton Hotel to the AFL-CIO, the country's largest union organization. The hotel had put in a special passageway after the JFK assassination. And today, Reagan, Secret Service code name Rawhide, would simply walk down the hallway from the exit on T Street Northwest a few paces into the limo. Code name Stagecoach. All anyone sees is a rope line with media, cameras, reporters, etc., the normal. And when the words, Mr. President, are heard, it's like any other moment of a presidency. Cameras following around. The president turns and his arm raises in the air. It sounded like little firecrackers going off, Deaver said. Reagan has time to say, what the hell is that? Before the pain starts. 20, maybe 30 seconds. That's all the whole thing is. It is complete and total chaos for all. It's like the shooter wants to empty the gun as soon as possible. Shot one hits press secretary James Brady. Shot two hits DC police officer Thomas Delaney. Shot three hits special agent Tim McCarthy. The limo door is not yet shut. The fifth shot hits the bulletproof window. And the sixth, we think, ricochets off the door. Cars on the walkie talkie. Rawhide is okay. I'm heading to Crown. Crown is the White House. Stagecoach speeds off. My job, Agent Parr would say later, was to see if he'd really been hit. I ran my hands under his coat, around his belt line, and I started working up to the armpit back of his neck. I didn't see blood at all. But about DuPont Circle, the president started spitting blood. And I just decided... He orders the driver to go to George Washington University Medical Center. Agent Parr was breaking procedure by going to the hospital. It could be an attack on the government. The safest place is the White House. That's the Secret Service procedure. Yet, Parr is the president's agent in the limo right now, and he's the one who can throw procedure out the window. David Prosperi, James Brady's assistant, has just seen his boss shot right in front of him. There's no one immediately that can help. Lifting him or touching him might do more harm than good. Prosperi runs into a hotel to try to find a phone. He calls the White House. Shots fired. Brady's been hit. Deaver calls Jim Baker at the same time. The White House knows now. And a meeting goes on in the situation room. Secretary of State Al Haig is a commanding figure at this point in the room. The helm is here, he says. Haig sends a message to all embassies. Flash, you will have heard that there was an attempt on the life of the president. His condition is stable and he is conscious. 
When Haig sends the memo, he's well aware that that might not be the case. Now, George Bush is in the air at this time. One of the people that's going to be with him is Jim Wright, who's going to end up being Speaker of the House. He's going to take over after Tip O'Neill and be ten times as worse, ten times more antagonistic towards the Reagan administration than uh, Tip O'Neill would ever have been. But uh, this is the early Reagan-Bush administration. They're trying to court Democrats. The Democrats are in control of Congress. They're courting Democrats in Texas. So... Jim Wright is on the plane with George H.W. Bush at the time that these events are going on. And they're gathering around a desk on Air Force Two that uh, has a phone, an enormous rotary dial phone. And it's not scrambled or anything. See, Air Force Two is really taken down from Air Force One, at least at this time. Nothing scrambled. Nothing's encrypted. It's a little crazy, actually. A small color TV is on. You know, they hear about what happens and they hear, okay, Reagan's not hurt. Directly behind the plane's cockpit, a teletype clacked underneath a panel of radios. Unlike the telephone, it was designed for top-secret communication. Looking down at the machine, an Air Force crewman became the first person outside a small circle in Washington to learn the truth. A coded cable from Haig read, Mr. Vice President, in the incident you will have heard by now, the president was struck in the back and is in serious condition. Medical authorities are now deciding whether or not to operate. Recommend you return to D.C. at the earliest possible moment. Lieutenant Colonel John Matheny, out of uniform, delivered the message to Bush in the stateroom. They can't go back to Washington. This is the trouble. There's not enough fuel in Air Force Two. The old plane carried 50,000 pounds less of fuel than Air Force One. So the decision is made. Major Orchard continues the original flight plan to Austin. They're not going back to D.C. Air Force Two needed a gas station. Might as well go to Austin as planned. On the ground in Austin, Governor Bill Clements stood with his wife, Rita, and the Texas Secretary of State. They're awaiting the vice president. They're going to take him to the legislature. But then the report comes out. The president had just been shot. Crowds befuddled. And at this time, you're getting to 325. PM. There's a series of events going on with Reagan in the hospital, but they can't know this right now. Uh, Air Force Two lands. Secret Service agents say, wait a second. We don't know what's going on here. We're not letting Bush out of the plane. So the governor and his wife and the Texas Secretary of State all boards. Here's what the Texas Secretary of State, George Strake, says. It was strange being on the plane, and at the time, you didn't know whether the president was dead or not. Everybody was trying to seek the honest condition of Reagan. The situation at the White House, and particularly in the Situation Room, has now become famous or infamous. Anybody here that does not have a top secret clearance? Anybody with our code word? Don't have it, please excuse yourselves for a moment. I think we need to uh, make sure that we don't break the law right here in the Situation Room. It's very confused. It's a question of who's in leadership. This is a very new administration. Al Haig had been second in command of the military at one point. He had been chief of staff at the White House previously. Now, James Baker has this job, but he's very new in it. He's now secretary of state. He's in the room along with the national security advisor, along with, um, of course, Casper Weinberger, the secretary of defense, And it's a very tense situation, and he's sort of running it. Now, there's actually tapes of this, which I hadn't been aware of when I did the first Reagan cast that I can share with you. You can just sense the confused situation. Did you get to George? No. I don't know what he called. I should have signaled before I thought we were calling him. He knows what he has to know. I have the uh, chairman chairman of the Joint Chiefs coming on, Jones, now in just a second. Tell him to get alerts to the uh, to the Strategic Air Command and uh, such other units as seem to him to be desirable at this point. Not to come here. What kind of alert, alert. Yeah. That's a standby alert. It's just a standby alert. You're not raising right now. And of course, we have the famous moment where Haig sees Larry speaks talking. Vice President Bush 
and is not happy with what he's saying. And he, you know, they're all new in this administration. Like, how do you get up to the press room? He's turning this into a goddamn disaster. And people are still confused. Who are you talking about? Speaks, Haig says. The first thing we have to worry about is the post-surgical report. That's right. And that ought to be the next time anybody opens their yak. I think going up and subjecting anybody to questions up there in that dirt there is a mistake now because nobody has enough information. And Haig rushes up to talk to the reporters himself. And that's where he makes the infamous statement, you know. Now I am in control here in the White House, pending return as vice president. Constitutionally, gentlemen, I'm at the helm. And, uh, you know, there's some debating about what he was really talking about. Bush is watching it from the plane. This from the Dallas Morning News. Bush had his shirt collar unbuttoned and his tie loosened. In his large chair at the kidney-shaped conference table, he watched the screen. And according to reports, he doesn't say anything but makes a face. The situation that's occurring uh, in the sit room is that the two Russian subs that we had talked about earlier on the East Coast had now turned into four subs. So this is a situation. So what's going on here? Casper Weinberger orders that there be another flyover and that we get ready because when you do a flyover, what you're assessing is what's the position that these subs, how far away are they, and how far do we have before a missile could be launched and hit Washington? Haig is upset with him because Haig comes down from his press conference. He had just told the press, in addition to his calming statement about him being in charge, um, he just told the press, you know, there isn't any alert here. And, you know, Weinberger is not pleased with Haig and just basically, well, as far as I'm concerned, you should have gone up there and talked to the press. <laughs> so um, that's all unfolding. A little more on the tape here. This submarine approach, uh, is that what's doing this or is it the fact that the president's under surgery? What, what, what's doing what, Al? That we are discussing whether or not to put the kneecap bird up in the air. Well, I'm, I'm discussing the point of view that at the moment, until the vice president actually arrives here, the command authority is what? And I have to make sure that it is essential that we do everything that seems proper. Huh? Can't read the Constitution. Well, I, I wouldn't get the Constitution. vice president any time you want. Uh, one way or another, uh, the initial steps, because he's not in a position there to, uh, to take all of them without uh, consultation, one way or another, we ought to prepare at least enough so that we can uh, uh, move more rapidly than we could otherwise. And uh, so Why? the discussion because of the kneecap is... Is it because against, of the submarine or because of the incident? That's the question I'm asking. The, 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 the reason that I ask to have the move to the planes is because of the incident. And I would continue to take that position until I know absolutely definitely that it's an isolated incident, which I think it is. But I don't know that yet, and I don't want to take any kinds of uh, risk. There's no the, the risk of some newspaper story or some rumor is a hell of a lot less than not having the things in place. We know Bush's first thoughts while he's on the plane because there's a piece of stationery. Uh, it's actually like the flight plan that the United States Air Force gives to the vice president. On the other side is where they're going and who's flying, etc. So he writes on this piece of blue paper that says, Welcome aboard, the United States Air Force. First thing he writes, Enormity of it comes upon me 20 minutes out of Austin. Pray, literally, that Ronald Reagan recovers. Element of friend, not just commander-in-chief. President decent, warm, kind. Not knowing, uncertainty, not panic, unknown. I mean, that's literally what he writes, unknown, underlined three times. Talk to Barr, Barbara Bush. Call Nancy, Nancy Reagan. 5 p.m., he notes, Murphy calling. 501, Ed Pollard, fly into hangar. Large crowd, security strong. 505, condition good, told Nancy Reagan. Ronald Reagan, still in surgery. Last note, Brady Critical, Land Air Force to Observatory, to sit room. In the stateroom aboard Air Force Two, the crewman, Pollard, the head of security detail, told Bush of arrival plans for Washington. The plane would taxi 
into Hangar 7 at Andrews Air Force Base. The vice president would walk outside under the gaze of sharpshooters to a Marine helicopter. That helicopter would then fly him to the south lawn of the White House. Here, Bush says no. Only the president lands in the south lawn of the White House. Something about landing in the south lawn didn't sit well with me, Bush told the news years later. It might have been great for TV, but I thought it would have sent the wrong message. I was also thinking about Nancy and how she probably didn't need that kind of distraction at that time. He's also getting relatively good news that they got the bullet out. What he doesn't know is how, you know, and, and this is a story not told of the whole assassination attempt, is how much the infection later, how much damage that was and potential danger, potentially dangerous that was. But they got the bullet out. That's good news. So at 6.30, nine hours after leaving Andrews, Bush's plane returns to D.C. At almost exactly 7, the vice president came to the situation room and very calmly assumed the chair at the head of the table. He says to Al Haig, Al, how are you? Good to see you. Haig completely changed demeanor, according to Dick Allen. He shut up when Bush came in. Then I briefed. Situation was clarified. The planned strike in Poland had been postponed. Allen and CI Director Casey provided fresh satellite images of Eastern Europe that showed no hostile troop movements near Poland. Hinckley had stalked President Carter, they found out, and Vice President Walter Mondale in Nashville, Tennessee, five months earlier. Apparently, Attorney General Smith says, he's one of those fellows who's just after somebody of note. And then you have... This moment, which is captured on the tape. My view is the more normal everything is, the better it is. I mean, I, I'd like to see us when we finish this round and not be this in this room. I mean, you go upstairs, the room, you know, unless, unless we're waiting for something extraordinarily sensitive because it gives a signal that we're all sitting around on the edge of some, uh, some uh, thing, which, of course, we could understand everybody's doing up to a couple of hours ago. Get back to normal, he tells everyone, and get out of the sit room. And he calls congressional leadership, calls Nancy Reagan, calls the wives of the D.C. policemen and Secret Service agents that are gunned down. And I believe set an important precedent for what happens in an emergency situation. That's why I think um, of the many things you can recall about George H.W. Bush, that March 30th, 1981, maybe underrated but is very important um brief thoughts about the presidency very brief you're you know i think you're going to hear a lot but i think as we discussed in the dozen ronald reagan's during reagan pres presidency there had been a lot of cuts in social programs cuts in education bush does sound a different note both at the convention you know that kinder gentler nation thing was a real statement um and it actually made Nancy Reagan a little upset, like kinder and gentler than what? Um, but it was a statement. You'll see him increase things like Pell Grants, aid to cities, education funding during his presidency. I think what the legislation that will be no touted most would be the Americans with Disabilities Act passed under his presidency. He always had a Democratic Congress, so there's some that's going to shape how a president acts. You know, there's always a Democratic House and Senate under Bush and Nixon. So that's shaped, you know, we don't know what they really wanted to do or would have done in a different political situation. But at least in that situation, you saw uh, that significant domestic legislation passed, which I think for people who are disabled now with the increasing aging of the population, I think it's become even more important that they're treated like people. And that unfortunately for those who have to pay costs, you know, they may grumble about it, but for that person who's disabled, they have more rights and they're not just treated as when we get around to it, that their rights are prioritized in law and in things like the construction of buildings and housing, how they're treated in the healthcare system and things like that. So an important piece of legislation that affects a broad group of people. He'll obviously be remembered for the first Gulf War. And I think the important actions of planning a, a use of military power, in this case to force Saddam Hussein, 
out of Kuwait, consulting with Congress, holding a congressional vote. Um, just like with his son and what his son would do later, I do question a congressional vote and, and how that was conducted because during that time, there certainly was an implication that I want a congressional vote, but I'm going to do this anyway. Well, you know, that does that's not exactly the kind of um, free and open vote that we, we want, but at least we, in the case of both Iraq invasions, it was a vote held so that Congress had to share in that decision a bit. It was a quick war. It was a successful one. There are some long-term implications of that war, I believe, because you're seeing after that American soldiers being stationed in Saudi Arabia and consequences that led to that. So, But if you're just looking at, during his presidency, what he's responsible for, a significant foreign policy achievement. Uh, did not win re-election, which puts him in that category of presidents who were one-termers. And that's just something you have to see. So he didn't have the political skills. This was an inside guy, the head of the CIA, uh, head of the RNC, you know, ambassador to China, uh, an inside guy. And sometimes I think you need that in the presidency, but it also doesn't make for the best politicians. And he was outdone in that category by Bill Clinton in the 92 election. Managing the process of the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the American response to those events, I think... Reagan gets a lot of the credit for opening up that dialogue with Gorbachev and vice versa, Gorbachev with Reagan. But, uh, you know, Bush, it, it takes somebody to to execute the takeoff of the plane and the landing of the plane. And George W. Bush is the landing of the plane. little bit of criticism that I think a lot of people rightly have about the freeze and the idea that when he got into office, him and Jim Baker had decided to kind of hold off Gorbachev for a critical six months that really, I think, weakened Gorbachev's position. As to whether that really affected things in the Cold War, whether things could have been different, like the coup uh, could have been avoided, that requires predicting Soviet politics, which is really difficult to do. So, you know, in the end, I think overall management of the Cold War situation was a net benefit for the country. And that's those are the type of things that, uh, in addition to being the father of a president, uh, those are the type of things that uh, he'll be remembered for. www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com is the website. Sign up for the premium cast. We have, uh, we just did another episode of our Revolutionary War Sketches. Um, I went into more detail about the story of Emerson Etheridge, who is that clerk of the house who tried to take over the house and his interesting story and how Lincoln reacted to that. A lot more detail on that on the premium cast or the extra cast from uh, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Thanks for listening. 